We're here today with internationally known MIT linguist Noam Chomsky, co-author of a recent science article on the evolution of language. That article is entitled, The Faculty of Language. What is it? Who has it? And how did it evolve? Professor Chomsky, in your long writings about the, uh, na the nature of language, acquisition of language by individuals has played an important part in your thinking, and you've commented on it in, in depth, its nature and its significance. On the other hand, the acquisition of language by our species seems to be a new topic for you, one you haven't talked about in, in detail before. Are you excited about this? And give us a little bit of background on um, your engagement in the topic. Well, uh, from my point of view, it, it became, uh, it's not lack of interest, it's just that I've never seen anything that could be said about it. Uh, it's both too hard and too easy. Uh, it's too easy because uh, it is so easy to make up all sorts of possible scenarios. In fact, you know, just they come to mind instantly, and a lot of them are in the literature. Uh, it's too hard because there's no way to tell whether any of them have any plausibility, let alone you know, or credibility. Uh, the problem, in, in my view, has always been to try to parcel out the topic in such a way that at least parts of it can be studied. And that's essentially what this is about. Actually, it doesn't say anything about the evolution of language. It just says, here's a way of looking at the topic with various components, some of which can be investigated by the comparative method, uh, which is about the only successful method, uh, some of which might be very significant if certain ideas about the nature, recent ideas about the nature of language are correct. So if it turns out that, in fact, to some, in some interesting sense, uh, the uh, computational system of the core computational system uh, has uh, optimization properties, in particular that it's something like an optimal solution to the problem of uh, linking uh, interface conditions, if that's true, uh, then there are many avenues to explore that could turn out to be interesting. Uh, they're kind of barely mentioned at the end. So th there are other optimization strategies and processes known in nature. And it's conceivable that this could be one of them, in which case, uh, you know, matter of things as remote as, say, uh, insect navigation or foraging strategies or uh, 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 the distribution of uh, the, the structure of the circulatory system, which optimizes in a certain sense, could turn out to be relevant to the evolution of language. Uh, the interface systems, it's possible that here's mostly uh, Mark Hauser and comes to Fitch's work. I don't know anything about it, but uh, they've done uh, a lot of work on uh, primates and even beyond. Uh, trying to investigate to what extent uh, sensory motor systems and uh, uh, harder question uh, conceptual systems uh, uh, in uh, other primates might have, or beyond in fact, uh, might have uh, uh, homologous, might be homologous to humans in some respect. But that is a topic that at least can be studied by, the com by comparative approaches. And if it's true that the fundamental nature of language uh, involves uh, interface conditions, which are mostly there independently of language. Maybe they were partly selected for language functions. Uh, if it involves interface conditions and uh, something like uh, optimization relative to interface conditions, which is a highly speculative idea, if that's true, then at least you can break the problem into uh, uh, parts that can be addressed in ways that are to some extent understood. You seem to arrange your, the proposal that you make in the paper between two different poles of thinking about this topic. One is that human language is basically analogous to things found in the animal world, maybe more difficult, more complex, but not different in kind. And the other is that it's completely unique, a completely unique mm -hmm. human adaptation. But your paper attempts to steer a third course between the two of them. Says, yeah, it says that... Can you say in, more about that? Uh, well, if this is all based on the assumption that it makes sense to think of language in terms of uh, some kind of optimization of uh, linking of interface conditions. If that 
basically, you know, if these ideas are wrong, then it's not going to go anywhere. But if there's something to those ideas, then uh, uh, both of the properties that you mentioned could turn out to be correct. Uh, that is, the uh, interface conditions could be uh, have uh, homologous structures in other, you know, say, other primates. Uh, but the linking seems to be uh, human unique, and the question is where that comes from. And if it turns out to be an optimization process, there are ways of thinking about it uh, that don't involve uh, the, you know, selectional leap that seems you know, almost impossible to explain. Say more about that. In the in the paper, you describe the um, the interface conditions as conditions interfaces between a cognitive system, cognitive intentional system, and a sensory motor system, with natural language forming a kind of bridge drawn between them yeah. at various points. Is and that that's the what seems picture? to be lacking in the most, in the cousins, you know, other primates. Uh, they don't seem, they have no uh, technique of, uh, what's lacking, and this has been observed for a long time, is something like uh, a recursive procedure that will permit uh, uh, that will generate uh, sound meaning pairs in some sense over an infinite range. Well, if the sound meaning parts are the interface conditions and uh, the recursive procedure is an optimization procedure, uh, then you've broken the topic of evolution of language into compartments, each of which can be investigated. I mean, the most of their work is on the sensory motor systems, which they argue uh, really are, uh, do have, uh, uh, don't have any unique, any particular unique uh, adaptation in humans, not, at least not a major one. On the conceptual intentional side, it's much more questionable. There are uh, uh, questions of how uh, uh, animal systems signal uh, uh, and how human uh, thought is expressed uh, raise many questions. Not at all clear that the human uh, mode of uh, uh, referring to things is at all related to animal signaling. That seems to have quite different properties. And that's just the beginning. You know, then you go on to more complicated things like you know quantifier structures and so on and so forth uh, that we don't even raise. But uh, the the real innovation in in uh, Homo sapiens appears to be uh, the overwhelming one uh, is uh, the recursive uh, process of uh, linking uh, two kinds of information. One kind that feeds sensory motor systems, the other that interacts with conceptual intentional systems. The human side, uh, the, the, the human language makes uh, the bridge, makes contact with the sensory motor system and you said that has analogs in the animal world. Is that really Maybe common, even right? homologs, which is different. Yeah, analogs are all over the place. Mm -hmm. But the question is whether there are uh, really homologous structures that you might trace back to uh, pre, you know, before the split between uh, uh, hominids and other primates, you know, five million years ago or something like that. Is that the idea then that the, the gestural system maybe of apes is the point at which language? Well, they're, no, actually they're talking about things like the, uh, the articulatory and uh, uh, perceptual systems. The gestural systems is a different question. I mean, uh, human gestural systems could turn out to be like other primate gestural systems. But isn't that a crucial component? I mean, what we know, for example, about natural language is that, uh, this is a point that you've um, emphasized in other interviews, is that it's not essentially vocal. That is, yeah. it's vocal, but it's also gestural, given the existence of sign, sign. language. Yeah, that raises new dimensions, which we don't go into there. But is there anything, it, uh, because it hasn't really been explored enough. I mean, to what extent are the, uh, um, the, the gestural systems involved in sign and the gestural systems that we otherwise use uh, seem to be dissociated? Uh, actually, this has been demonstrated uh, pretty persuasively, I think, in acquisition of sign. I mean, th there are some dramatic cases, like uh, Laura Petito's work on uh, 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 acquisition of uh, the use of pronouns, first and second person pronouns in uh, sign and spoken language. I mean, th there's a s basically it works like this. There's a stage in uh, 
uh, uh, spoken language development, norm of what we're used to, in which children uh, invert uh, you and I. So they'll say, pick you up, meaning pick me up. They hmm. regard you as, they hear you as referring to themselves, so they think that's who it is. And they hear I as referring to that person over there, so they think that's who it is, mm -hmm. so they interchange. And then after a while, this goes away. It's a kind of a pretty standard, presumably maturational process that goes on. Well, Laura Petito found the same thing happens in sign uh, at about the same age. And there it's quite striking because I and you are uh, iconic. You is this and mm -hmm. I is that. And the oh, infants at the same age uh, act counter-iconically. Hmm. So it's not just uh, abstract, you know, you and I interchange, but that and that interchanges. Furthermore, it turns out that at the same period, they use this and this for pointing correctly. So they have the pointing system iconically they have the linguistic system, which is counter-iconic, uh, at the same stage at which uh, sp um, spoken language children are uh, inverting the pronouns. So it looks, uh, that kind of evidence seems wow. to suggest that gestural systems and linguistic systems, even though they may have the exact same motor element involved in them, are just different systems. They also seem po probably to be neurally dissociated. In the sense you could do brain studies that yeah, show I mean, they're, they're activating different areas? It looks like it, yeah. In fact, uh, this began, this is work uh, done by Ursula Bluji and Ed Klima and others at Salk Institute, uh, which has been going on for, I guess, about 20 years now. Uh, they discovered to everybody's surprise that uh, uh, for signers, uh, this, they began with aphasia studies, in fact, most of it still is aphasia, that uh, for signers, uh, the uh, language faculty is still left hemisphere uh, uh, dominant. And it had been suspected it's probably right hemisphere dominant because it's visual. But it turns out to be, look very much like spoken language, despite the difference of modality. And they've also discovered something beyond that. I mean, discover is strong. These are hard things to do. But they have evidence that uh, for both spoken language and sign, uh, uh, local analytic uh, computation, like sentence structure, is left hemisphere uh, mm -hmm. specialized, but uh, global computation, like discourse structure, uh, is right hemisphere localized for both sign and, uh, and spoken. Or at least that's what their evidence looks like. Uh, imaging studies are just barely beginning. That should have said more light on it. Does that provide as it were, neurological evidence that the sentence is a, a special sort of unit for linguistic computation? It's, it's not, evidence. paragraphs are not just big sentences? Mm -hmm. Provides, you know, evidence to the extent, I mean, this is all pretty weak evidence because very little is understood about it, but it looks like that. You know. And it, going back to the original question, this does raise serious issues about the ways in which the sensory motor system imposes critical conditions uh, on uh, uh, the operations of the computational system because it seems it's getting to be more and more plausible to believe that uh, human language is not modality specific even though it's overwhelmingly in the speech hearing modality. But that would put serious constraints on our ability to figure out when natural language Evolved. For example, there's at least a two-decade-old research program by Philip Lieberman, Jeffrey Leitman, collaborators, that has attempted to look at the comparative anatomy, both of extant primates, their vocal tract anatomy, yeah. and also reconstruct the soft tissue anatomy of extinct hominids on the idea that basically if they couldn't make the sounds, they didn't have the language. Yeah, that's pretty controversial. I mean, it looks as though, uh, but this is, again, I don't, enter into this, I don't know anything about it, but uh, Hauser and Fitch uh, uh, both are very skeptical about that, as are others. Uh, it seems that uh, some of the um, uh, properties that they found are all over the primate uh, you know, kingdom, and uh, that it may be that hundreds of thousands of years ago, the uh, hominids from which we're ultimately descended uh, had the 
what look like the physical capacities to produce language. But your point is correct. If the spoken, if the speech hearing modality is not critical to it, this would be significant, but not overwhelming, you know, like another organism could use sign. You know? Yeah, exactly. It could have existed as, as a humans great deal earlier. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, but that does raise the question about the uh, look, a search for homologous structures in the sensory motor system. It should be extended, and we all know that, uh, to asking whether uh, what is the character of the uh, um, um, gestural systems that are used for language as distinct from the gestural systems which are physically identical but that are part of a different system, gesturing. How is that possible? I mean, how could it be possible Seems to, to be have true. two overlapping? Well, take the pointing case. It's the most dramatic example, but there are others. It's highly dramatic because we think, I mean, our, our intuition about sign language, obviously completely mistaken, is that it is somehow iconic. Yeah. It, it, well, you know, it, it, somehow it is. Like, you know, when you, I mean, when you're a, a signer will set points in visual space and refer back to them, it's the anaphora system. But it does go through the peri periods which indicate that the uh, uh, that it is that even the physically identical gestures are somehow different uh, if they're linguistic and non-linguistic, and the uh, neurological evidence uh, indicates the same. In fact, if you look more deeply at sign language, it supports the same conclusions. I mean, Petito's results are particularly dramatic because it's a you know because of the counter iconic usage and the parallel to normal. Uh, to the normal acquisition for speaking, hearing children. Uh, so it's, but th th this is all fairly recent work. You know, it's kind of developing fast and should set a lot. It, it could turn out that the major constraints, interface constraints, for the computational system are on the conceptual intentional side, which makes the problem very hard because that to to study that independently of language is very difficult. I mean, it's hard to study thought except through the medium of language, which will beg the questions. How, in principle, could we even approach that question? Well, you can do it. I mean, there's studies of what are called uh, uh, the apes theory of mind or the infant, the pre-linguistic infant's theory of mind. I mean, at what point do, or, or do, for example, is a factual question, do, say, uh, other primates uh, attribute uh, something like beliefs uh, to, to you know, their uh, other members of their species? Can they attribute false beliefs, for example? And there are ways of studying this. There's just some interesting recent published work reviewing it, a book by uh, uh, Ann and David Primack just came out, which has reviews a lot of the uh, uh, material on this thing. It's called the Original Intelligence or something. Mm -hmm. So the major constraints actually might be yeah. on that side rather than the sensory motor system. Well, unless something system. can be learned about the, I mean, by now a lot is known about the perceptual, uh, the uh, auditory and articulatory apparatus. M much less is known about the uh, systems of gesture that are used in sign. What, what are their structural properties? Uh, you know, how are they distinguished from other gestures and so on? But, it, but, but undoubtedly there's, going to be something to be said about that. And that may impose the kinds of constraints that are similar to the ones we're more familiar with from uh, uh, articulatory and uh, auditory systems. And in those systems, uh, there's reasonably good evidence, I think. Again, for me, this is secondary. I only mm -hmm. know it indirectly. But it looks to me like there's plausible evidence that the systems are not, in any crucial sense, human-specific. You make a startling um, suggestion at the end of this article that even the recursive procedures, the what you call the narrow faculty of language, the sort of yeah. core of it, specifically understood, might actually have been adapted or accepted, um, co-opted from another system having to do with navigation. Can well, you, what's well, that idea? Well, you know, this goes back to old ideas. I mean, it's, it's you know, everyone knows that uh, if you want to. Uh, if you take an, a, a, a mature organism, say, you know, a person or a worm or anything you pick, and you ask about the factors that lead it to be what it is, uh, there are many different factors. I mean, one is whatever effect experience had 
another is uh, what there's an expression of the genes. A third factor is how the laws of nature work. I mean, the, the laws of nature work in ways which permit certain kinds of development, not others. Uh, and uh, exactly what the effect is of those constraints is not too well understood. It's a hard problem. Actually, it's a problem Turing worked on for a good part of his life. Uh, classic work is by Darcy Thompson. There's more recent work by others. But there are many properties of organisms that uh, seem to just be consequences of the way the laws of nature work, uh, which is, you know, in, in a sense, it's a truism. But uh, to, to find the effect of those is hard. Well, we're talking about computational systems. Uh, and computa how, how would the laws of nature operate in these? Well, one might expect that the way they work is by uh, imposing conditions of efficient computation, some sort of optimization conditions. And things like that are found throughout nature. So insect navigation seems to have optimization properties. As I mentioned, foraging seems to optimize. Uh, there's recent work suggesting that uh, by Christopher Cherniak at the University of Maryland that uh, the uh, arrangement of the neural systems, at least in simple animals, he suggests beyond, uh, may not be genetically programmed, but just uh, be uh, what he calls minimization of wire length. I mean, using the same procedures that engineers use when they try to get the, the best possible transistor. You know, you just make the, what he calls the best of all possible brains. You know, it just sort of turns out that way. Uh, the circulatory system seems to work similarly. It looks like there's some optimization in the way it sort of scatters around the body. Uh, and it's possible that these things are just deep natural laws. Uh, and somehow or other, they, you know, here, here, the step that took place is to the step of linking the external conditions. And you know, what could have happened is that as soon as that step was taken, let's link them, it immediately became optimal. Uh, and now comes the linguistic question. To what extent can we show that the actual linguistic systems do have optimal properties. That's what the work in the minimalist programs involved with. And uh, that's how the issue, you know, that's how, at least for me and for, I think, my colleagues, the question of uh, bringing the evolution of language to uh, uh, a stage where parts of it can inv be investigated, that's where it sort of comes together. So recursion basically provided the link, but then there's an issue of optimizing the character yeah. of the link. Right. So, for example, if the character of the link is uh, the way I personally assumed it to be, say, 10 years ago, uh, extent, say the article that Howard Lasnik and I wrote uh, summarizing what we thought was the state of the art, if it's like that, it's very far from optimal. I mean, there were all sorts of properties in the system, uh, different levels that uh, aren't interface levels, uh, you know, strange conditions, uh, you know, all sorts of things. And if that's the way the system actually works, it looks very far from optimal. But if you can demonstrate that those empirical assumptions were wrong, that there really are no levels other than the interface levels, and that the operations do reduce in some interesting sense to the one operation that comes free in a recursive system, namely combining take, together. Take two things you formed and make a bigger one. You know, that comes free, and it can be internal or external. That yields what we call movement in a automatic way. And if you can show that that works by optimal conditions, like some of these uh, probe goal theories, well, okay, then you're. I mean, it is a huge empirical question, but there's an there's a task. And it's a question how far you can carry it out to see if you can show that all of the technology that's used in uh, descriptive and explanatory work in linguistics can be shown to be an artifact, uh, a, a, a uh, just a reflection of optimal computational procedures. It's a huge task. But there's been, I think, at least to me, some significant progress in it. To the extent that that can be carried out, you have a picture of the evolution of language, uh, which is, to, to oversimplify it, as we do there, it would look like, like the following. 
and this is surely oversimplified, the uh, uh, interface systems uh, are there pretty much independently of language. And you find them something like them, at least, in other organisms. And you can study their, their evolution by usual methods, comparative methods. Uh, somewhere comes the, uh, the step of saying, OK, let's link these. Then automatically comes optimization of the linkage, which is the recursive system that uh, meets optimal conditions. And then you have this basic core of human language. And it may not have changed since then. I mean, that's you know, like the ideal, how close you can get to that is a good question. But if it's correct, then to get back to your original question, could well be that the things as, that look as remote as insect navigation uh, illustrate the uh, principles that showed up in uh, optimizing the link. I see. It wasn't the link itself that was no, derived, no. but the optimization. The link some, comes from somewhere. But, you know, that's the way evolution works. I mean, if you look at, say, uh, uh, systems that respond to light, like the eye, or maybe in you know, uh, phototropic uh, plants and so on, they got to come from somewhere. And it seems that where they came from was uh, some stochastic process that introduced into a cell a uh, class of molecules by accident, you know, that, which uh, happened to convert uh, uh, light into chemical energy, rhodopsin molecules. When they get into a cell, then you've got the basis for all systems that respond to light. Mm -hmm. But how that happened, as you know, it's not a wasn't by selection. It's just something that happened. You know. And it could be that the linkage is something that happened. Once it's uh, established, you turn to the laws of nature to determine how it should work. There are a lot of puzzles on the question of not only how it happened, but when it happened. Yeah. So for example, in the evolution of our own species, Homo sapiens, there's a great mystery surrounding um, a certain kind of explosive Big Bang development that occurred mm -hmm. about 30,000 years ago. Yeah. We know that you know, modern humans came in about 100,000 years ago, coexisted with other species like Neanderthals for maybe 60,000 years, and then suddenly there was this very dramatic change apparently in human culture, and some have speculated that it was the origin of language yeah. only 30,000 years ago that did it. Does that seem remotely plausible? Well, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of evidence that, you know, roughly in that range, maybe 30, 50,000 years, something like that, there was an explosive change in the uh, degree of inventiveness of tools, of um, different kinds of symbolism, even of this magnificent artwork that you see in Lascaux and so on. Uh, but there's no evidence, as far as I know, for any physiological changes right. during the first 50,000 years. And it looks as if uh, contemporary humans are genetically you know, almost identical, no matter when they separated from the original you know, small breeding group, uh, maybe around 100,000 years ago. So it's a fair question what happened in those first, first 50,000 years. But it's one of the many mysteries. <laughs> but, and more than that, though, it would suggest that after that link was drawn, we were in some sense genetically distinct from other members of our own species, which would make it puzzling unless how the, language well, could have you know, Unless spread. the fact, I mean, uh, there's another possible, and this is all total speculation, yeah. here's a possible scenario. Around 100,000 years ago, it was all sitting there in the brain. But then, and you know, establishing the link uh, could have been like uh, making the first tools, you know. I mean, it just, just happens. I mean, the same sort of question arises about you know, when, uh, early hominids began flaking stones to make tools, you know, how'd they figure it out? I mean, once it was done, it had enormous effects on the species. It opened up new sources of uh, protein and so on and so forth, and you know, all sorts of effects. But it happened somehow, you know, we don't know how. And uh, the, the ability to do it had already been there before it happened, obviously, otherwise it couldn't have happened. Uh, now, it's possible that the ability to make the link was there, say, 100,000 years ago, and it just various, maybe independently, in various separated groups, somehow it happened, like tool making. And once it happened, you've got language, and then they're all going to look alike, because they're all coming from the same genetic base. <laughs>
So it lay fallow for 60,000 years? Yeah, just how long did, did the tool making lay fallow? Oh, no. uh, maybe millions of years, for all we know. Hmm. It, and in fact, anything you look at, you, it, the same question is going to arise. I mean, it's kind of striking to us because we think about language, but you can really ask the same questions about every stage of tool production hmm. or any other cognitive capacity. Well, Professor Chomsky, thank hmm. you very much. Okay. <laughs> We're now going to take um, questions from our studio audience. Please uh, step to the mic and ask your question. Um, you seem to be substituting the word optimization of the linking process or something like that for the process that others would say is guided by natural selection, more or less. Um, and those others would say that natural selection is or someday will be adequate to explain the development of the human faculty of language. So I'm just wondering if you can explain why you think that natural selection isn't adequate or isn't an appropriate term to use here and how it falls short as an explanatory device. Well, I, I don't see any reasonable selectional procedure, mechanism, that could have led to the uh, development of an optimal linkage. Uh, and there are many aspects of organic growth where we know that selection is just not the factors that are involved. Uh, so if you look at uh, um, say, uh, symmetry of uh, the, the, there's a lot of s symmetrical structures in organism design. Uh, there are uh, uh, there are many, as I mentioned, optimization processes that takes pl take place. Uh, the, um, it takes a the way proteins fold, something as simple as that. It's not a matter of natural selection. That's just the way the world works. Mm -hmm. uh, and the way the world works affects the way organic entities work. So it's just an empirical, I mean, there's nothing, spe you know, it, it, everyone agrees that natural selection is an important factor in evolution. But to try to sort out its, uh, uh, the effects of that factor is extremely hard, uh, even in the most uh, elementary systems we know anything about, because there are all sorts of other factors, like uh, chemical and physical laws and maybe mathematical principles of organization. So there's no kind of, you know, a priori stand that you have to take and then argue against. The question is just to discover what it is. And uh, here are some suggestions as to what it could be. If someone has some selectional ideas, fine, look at those. But, the, but the, they don't have any particular priority. Yeah. Good morning, Professor Chomsky. Uh, I'm a biologist, and actually the question I have is sort of a follow-up to this one. When a biologist looks at something as complex as the FLN, the recursion device ostensibly is, the first question, two questions you ask is, what is it for, and what is it from? That is, what did it evolve from? And you've suggested that maybe it didn't evolve, or at least that's not the right way to look at well, it. Well, it evolved, but uh, I, the way it's property molecules right. getting into the right. cell evolved. Well, it's also evolution. So its properties, in other words, on that view, are more contingent on its function, its its contemporary function, rather than its evolutionary origin. Well, see, even that's misleading because th there's a factual question about what the function is. I mean, the usual assumption about language has been that its function is to facilitate communication. Right. This I've never believed that, and this point of view takes a very different approach. Mm -hmm. It says the function, if you want to use the right. word, of language is to link interface conditions. And when you look here, it's just an empirical question. And when you look closely at the structure of language, I could mention some cases. I think what you find is that the computational system is optimal, is apparently optimal with regard to linking the interface, right. but is very non-optimal with regard to communication. Uh, I see. So but I actually have a specific question about its origin. So it, there is a case to be made that animal minds evaluate contingent circumstances and control their mo purposeful motion in response to those, that those systems are in fact hierarchically nested and combinatorial. There's actually an argument to be made that that's true. That looks remarkably like the FLN. That looks remarkably like the recursion device. And if that's true, in turn, then it means that the properties of the recursion device, perhaps including some that look suboptimal for its function, are in fact like the bones in a bird's wing. They are historical accidents rather than functional properties of the system. Could you uh, perhaps explore that just for a yeah. moment, whether you like or dislike that view? There's a difference between hierarchical structure and recursion. Mm 
And there's all kinds of, it takes uh, the yeah. birds and uh, you know, the, right. the bones and I got five fingers, uh, right. other animal has three, you know, and right. so on. That's hierarchical structure, but it's not recursion. There's no recursive process that uh, gives you an arbitrary number of fingers, each stage of which has particular significance. Remember, this recursion is not like, uh, you know, walking. I mean, you take one step and then two steps and then three steps. Right. Uh, every stage in the process has particular significance, determined significance at two interfaces. And that's something completely different than hierarchical structure. Yeah, I was actually referring to things like Biederman's view of perception, for example, that it's, that it's inherently combinatorial and hierarchically nested. Do you like but or dislike it, that view? Yeah, it's fine. I mean, in fact, maybe th we could have gone into this, in fact, I mentioned it, that the, uh, could be that the recursive systems uh, not only Maybe they're connected with insect, with whatever's involved in insect navigation, but they could also be uh, involved with what a lot of perceptual psychologists call the rules of vision. You know, the rules that uh, make you see uh, uh, some object, uh, some presentation as a three-dimensional object in motion. I mean, there's a very pretty well understood by now computational procedure that uh, determines that from very few presentations, like three tachistoscopic yep. presentations, yep. Uh, get you to see a rigid object in motion. Okay, there's some kind of principles involved in that, and it wouldn't be outlandish to assume that those what are called rules of seeing, you know, are similar in some way to whatever's going on here. Now, I mean, like, this didn't come from nowhere, you know. The question is where it came from. and. Uh, in my view, an exciting and not implausible conclusion is that it just comes from the way nature works uh, with right. computational systems, and therefore you're going to find it all over the place. I guess if, yeah. if there's, there's one more question, I'm, I'm really against, as a biologist, struck by why linguists are, I'm not sure the word is hostile, but apparently indifferent to this question of what language is for. A biologist look at that and, and say that, look at language, look at its sophistication, and it's, it, it's Paley's watch on a heath. It's a complex thing that can only ultimately be produced as a result of its adaptive consequences. The only ad apparent adaptive consequences are the ones we think that leap immediately to mind, that is exchange of information, cooperative no, exchange see, of information. if that's what leaps to mind, it's just a mistake. I mean, just <laughs> look at the, I mean, if you want to look Well, it at leaps the, to the mind of almost every biologist okay, in the world, I must tell you. <laughs> I mean, if, when you, uh, the notion of function is a very, you know, loose and vague notion. We all know that. So what's the function of the skeleton? I mean, is it to keep you from falling into a puddle on the ground, or is it to store calcium, or is Well, it if it's properly construed, it's not narrow. To ask what the function of a bird wing is, is a well-focused question. Maybe. But, uh, you know, if you actually look at the history of it, it's not so well-focused. The evolution of it, it's quite complicated, a lot of acceptation, and so on and so forth. But uh, it, the notion of what a function is is a very vague notion. However, what is usually assumed, plausibly, is you can get some guide to what the function is by looking at the characteristic use. Okay, yes. well, let's take the characteristic use of language. Characteristic use of language is for thought, not for communication. Almost all language use, close to 100%, is internal. My understanding was that that's controversial. That is, in it's particular, that most thought is, in fact, not linguistic. Oh, that's another question. Yes. There could be plenty of thought that's not linguistic, right. but I'm asking a different question. Uh -huh. What's the use of language? Statistically speaking, it's almost all internal. Uh, if you want to check that, just introspect for a couple of hours. Well, but, but, that's, ba <laughs> but that's, based on, that's based on introspection. I could make no, the counter- based on observation. Well, that introspection is a kind of observation. Yes, I, I agree mean, with that. if we had an outside way of looking at introspection, we'd find the same thing. But an equivalently plausible interpretation of that is that that appears to be true subjectively because the purpose of language is to prepare our thoughts for the ultimate purpose of social communication. Well, you can it doesn't say this control you, thought. Yeah, you in the can sense say this if you want, but that's now we're off way and out. No, of those are equal. Those are competing models no, no, that should not. be susceptible I mean, to test. Yeah, all we right. know is all we know is the following: that the overwhelming use of language close to 100% is internal. And when you think about what that internal stuff is, it has very little to do with communication. Like you can spend half your life uh, obsessing because somebody criticized you 10 years ago. You don't expect to communicate it, but that's the kind of thing that goes on your mind all the time. Or well, you, you can, you know, you can think about <laughs> but it But ostensibly you're things. preparing for an, for an inadvertent meeting with that person, Who are says? you? Maybe, maybe it's somebody, an argument maybe somebody died. You know, I mean, it's just not, you know, it's just factually well, not yeah. correct. 
It's, it, it's true. It is that an it's, arguable point. It's true that, look, everything's arguable, but the overwhelming evidence is that internal thought is playing some function for us. Yeah. You know, planning, um, agonizing, uh, whatever we do with right. it. Right. And some tiny piece of it ends up as being communication. This Incidentally, plenty of other things are involved in communication, too. Now, it could, you can always make up a story. That's one of the things about evolutionary f fairy tale manufacturing. Or about all of science. But they're not they're, they're of, about stories, yes, they yeah, are. Not Testable all, stories, not hopefully. all of science, just so stories yeah. are particularly prominent in this domain. But if you want to use uh, plausible arguments, like characteristic use tells you something about function, uh, then I think you'd have to say that the, that the function of language in this loose sense is uh, for, th for thought. Some of it ends up being communication, very small parts. In fact, even the part that is externalized is communication only in a very odd sense. Mm -hmm. I mean, like if you meet somebody at a, I mean, it's very hard for people to be next to each other and not to talk to each other. Yeah. It's kind of, you know, it's like dogs looking at, you know, another's eye. You just have to talk to each other. Uh, so if you meet some, you're standing with somebody at a bus stop, it's just uncomfortable if you're not talking to them. So you talk to them about the weather or the baseball right. game or something. That's not communication. That's just, uh, it's, it's sometimes called phatic communication. Yeah. It's just a sure. way of establishing human relations. Social. Uh, yeah, human, but that's not communication in the sense of transmitting information or anything. Uh, if by communication you just mean interacting with other people, mm -hmm. well, yeah, okay. Uh, then uh, it would turn out, if you do it descriptively, I think it would turn out like this. Uh, overwhelmingly, language is internal. I mean, it's literally close to 100%. Uh -huh. uh, some of it is externalized. Of the part that's externalized, a lot of it is just uh, phatic communication, meaning right. we want to be part of a group or we don't right. want to feel hostile to each other. Like, right. you don't look at a person, you don't, this, uh, like gaze is always off to the side or you stay at a certain mm -hmm. distance from somebody right. and that sort right. of thing. A lot of it just seems to be like that. And some very small part of it right. is communication in some independent sense of the word communication. So you well, you can make up a story saying that it's that very small part that mm -hmm. drives the system, but we have no evidence for it. Furthermore, if you look at the mechanics of the system, now we're getting into more technical aspects. I think you can show that a lot of the mechanics of the system are badly designed for communication and well designed for linking the interfaces. Actually, one mm -hmm. important asp case of this, which is, if, you, if, you, uh, if any of you are writing parsing programs, you know, programs where you're trying to do uh, automated parsing, uh, there's one overwhelming problem that you always face. And that is uh, a word comes along, like a WH word, you know, what or something like that. And you know, because of the way language works, that there's going to be, it's going to be linked to some position in the sentence. But that position happens to be a, a not heard, it's a gap. So you have the problem of taking a word, who, and figuring out what unexpressed, uh, there's no space, there's no break, there's mm -hmm. no nothing, but what point in the utterance is it connected with? Just think how easy it would be if uh, you repeated it. So if you, if you didn't say, what did you see, but what did you see what? Okay, then the problem's trivial. Uh, however, that's computationally more difficult. If you look at the way our beliefs about the computational systems, if they are recursive as in the way we think, that would involve more computation uh, for linking the interfaces. So here's a pretty striking case, and there are quite a lot more, where the system seems to be mechanically designed so that it reduces computation and increases the problem of, of uh, perception. And I think there are a lot of okay. cases like this. Susan? Thank you. Thank you. It's very interesting to hear how language may have evolved as a response to the interface conditions between intentionality and sensory motor systems. And so we've been talking about the past 100,000, 30,000, whatever, um, in terms of our time course. What about the future? Are we done? Is the language mechanism now finished? Is this the uh, masterpiece? Or are we, are we going no, to continue to no, adapt? There's no relevant evolution going on. I mean, there's some, you know, humans are changed all the time. Different groups change. But you know, the time scale is so small that the chances of significant genetic change involving something like the language faculty look uh, pretty marginal. But even in another 100,000 years, can you envision? You know, so little is known about this that you can say anything you like. 
<laughs> but the chances, I think most biologists would agree that we're just talking about much too small a time scale. So everyone will speculate about the past, no one will speculate about the future. Don't forget. You know, mm -hmm. there's no, I mean, for real changes to take place, there have to be separation of species. They have to stop, they have, of subspecies. Uh, you have to stop interbreeding for a long time before speciation takes place, mm -hmm. real genetic change. And how that happens is mostly mysterious, but it does seem to require a pretty sharp break in interbreeding right, over a long stretch. Uh, uh, and that just doesn't happen with humans. Right. So perhaps we could use simulation to try to um, explore some of these ideas since we really can't do it in the real world too easily. No, you can won't speculate. Okay. It, you could do simulation <laughs> if you understood the processes. Mm -hmm. But since you don't understand the processes, you can't do simulation. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, just a short question on the role of the sensory motor uh, interface, because in the um, earlier discussion, it seemed as though what was crucial about the combinatorial system and so on is that it made the link between these two, these these two things, and the output of the sensory motor uh, interface is, as, as you have been have been saying, so some kind of some kind of physical event, either. Sound, hand motion or yeah. sounds or something. And if language is sort of making that link between, say, the inside and, and the physical world, then in the, the, the response to the earlier question about, say, uh, the function of language as b being a vehicle for expressing thought, then it raises the question of, of what, what's the other half of the link in the 100% use or almost 100% use of, of, um, of language as you, as you described. This what, what is, what's at the other end of, of the link, mm -hmm. the other end of, the previous end of which is, right. is the conceptual so motor, conceptual it's, interface It's an extremely interesting question and here we don't have any, anything in the way of solid evidence, mm -hmm. but we have a ton of introspective evidence and that's evidence. All right, introspect for a while. When you're talking to yourself, you're producing something which you he is the same as what you hear. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I mean, okay. and that's a, an enormous amount of our life is producing to ourselves something that in our head sounds just like something we're hearing. Uh, here's a question which I don't know the answer to, and I don't think it's mm -hmm. been investigated. Uh, do signers yeah. that, that was visualize? The, the next question. Was, well, I don't yeah. think it's been investigated, but I would assume so. Mm -hmm. I, if that's the case, mm -hmm. then the you know, the internal part of the sensory motor system is really functioning. Okay, so this I, I think it's very hard to mm -hmm. talk to yourself and not do Use it in a sense yeah. of English. Right. You know? mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so this is, all, this is, I mean, is in fact, you yeah, can early, tell, earlier, look, early when you're talking to, your, when you're talking to yourself, here, you can right. figure out if the sentences rhyme, for example. True enough. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, all of okay. these things are easy, in fact, uh, automatic. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Thanks very much. Okay. Mm -hmm.